quite a morning, right? So I got up early to uh, remove some snow and got about 20 feet down the driveway and my snowblower broke down. Yay. And uh, Vicky was out there shoveling with me and I used my uh, lar- little lawn ride-along mower to try to push it out. But having said that first hour, now I got Mark Engen coming over to remove snow for me with his uh, skid loader. Yay! So I guess if you just say things, people respond, God's good, huh? So uh, I uh, like... Uh, like Ryan, I applaud you for being here this morning. It took some effort in to, to kind of break through that barrier and be present. Aaron and I were walking in together and trying to figure out whose fault this was. That it keeps snowing like this. This is my fourth Sunday of this experience. And we were kind of, kind of commiserating and talking. He goes, well, it probably is my fault because every time I try to go to Aberdeen, it snows. And so we concluded that it's both our faults. Sorry about that, you guys, that it snows like this on Sunday mornings. But anyway, glad you're here and glad you're, you're, you're with us this morning. Um, anybody know who this guy is? Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, Toy Story 4 just came out again. This is a popular series that never sees it go away. This Buzz Lightyear was owned by my son, Peter. His name is on the shoes. Um, and um, he got this... Uh, when he was a little guy, he's now 25 years old. And I thought, wow, this has been around for a while. And people tend to know the Buzz Lightyear saying, right? To what? Yeah, very good. First hour, all 10 of them didn't know that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we didn't have a big first hour. By, by, by the end of the service, it, it had grown to, you know, 20. But no, I'm just joking. It was, it was actually bigger than that. It, uh, it was... About 100 maybe. <laughs> so at uh, any rate, um, but today's message is entitled Breaking Barriers and Beyond. And I want you to kind of think of that in, 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 in regards to the Buzz Lightyear way of saying to infinity and beyond. Today we're going to look at breaking barriers and beyond in Jesus Christ. Uh, last couple of weeks, Pastor Aaron's been uh, going through John chapter 3 with us. This morning we get to John chapter 4. And what we're going to see in John chapter 4 is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the great barrier breaker. And more than breaking barriers in in our lives, he moves us way beyond that to what we're supposed to be in in God. So listen to uh, John chapter 4 this morning. I'm going to begin with uh, uh, verse 1. Listen to what it says here. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, "'Will you give me a drink?' His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped in this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshiper will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This is profound scripture. 
Just amazing. First, we have to note this. Jesus came into a culture that was extraordinarily segregated. And for him to sit at that well and to talk to a Samaritan was just out of the box. Radical. And he not only asked uh, or talked to her, he actually asked her to do something for him, to get him a drink of water, meaning he would touch the implements that she would have used to get water. Now, at that time, the Jews thought that holiness, more purity, was being separated from the impure. And to touch a Samaritan, to talk with a Samaritan, was really to touch impurity and to become defiled. And Jesus violated that segregation just by conversing with the woman. It's so radical. I don't think we, well, I don't think we can even realize how radical this was. And not only was he talking to a Samaritan, but she was a woman. And rabbinical teachers of that time didn't talk to women. It just wasn't done. She's so shocked that he's doing this. She goes, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Who were the Samaritans? Let me give you just a little bit of a background here on them. They were a combination of Jew and Gentile in terms of their heritage. The race came about after the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. Certain people from the Jewish culture elected to stay in that area when when Israel exited it. And they intermarried with the Assyrians and that's where they think the Samaritan race came from. And these folks had no dealings with the Jews. The Samaritans had their own temple. They had their own copy of the Torah, which is the five, uh, first five books of the Old Testament. They had their own religious system. There was a disagreement between the Jews and the Samaritans where the proper place of worship was. The Samaritans thought it was in the mountains. The Jews thought it was in Jerusalem. Jesus came to this woman, and he's a great barrier breaker. He broke right through this cultural barrier of his day, and he interacted with the Samaritan. But I just got to talk to you about her being a woman. I mean, women in biblical times, they didn't even have, in the Jewish culture, that is, didn't even have the status of that of Gentile, hardly. Um, they, 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 they couldn't even testify in a court. They, they weren't allowed to testify uh, in, a, in the Jewish court system. I find that utterly interesting because when Christ is resurrected over in Luke chapter 24. Who does he appear to first? Women. (laughs) Isn't that just like God? He appears to women first. A class of people in that culture that couldn't even testify in court. They didn't have the status to be credible witnesses in the judicial system of that time. So who does Jesus appear to first? Women! They can't testify in their own culture, but they could testify of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Is not God the great barrier breaker? He just does radical things. If you were a woman at that time, you probably would stay home. That would be your role, unless your husband passed away and you were forced into the marketplace. Most likely, if you are a woman at that time in that Jewish culture, You were not afforded the opportunity to learn, so you were illiterate. As a rule in that culture at that time, women were separated from men in private, public, and religious lives. They lived a separate life. I was reading about this in one uh, Talmudic passage that was derived from some rabbinical Judaism at that time, summed up a woman's plight during uh, that time this way. They are swathed, wrapped up in clothes. You you who have young babies, right? You will swaddle your kids, right? Wrap them all up so they feel secure. Women at that time were swathed. They were isolated from people and shut up in prison. That's how they were considered. And Jesus just broke through that barrier also. He broke through that barrier of her being a Samaritan, and he broke through that barrier of her being a woman, and he talked to her about true faith. And he had this discussion 
of who he was and who she was. And he's breaking through this isolation. He's breaking through this imprisonment that she's been experiencing at that time. Isn't that just like our Jesus? He came to set the captives free, right? To declare liberty in him. And, and he's doing this with this woman. Reflect on this with me. It's human nature to build fences. You look at our history as a nation. We've had just all kinds of fences built whether they be a social fence or racial fences over time. And still these things tend to haunt us today. Even, in, even there tends to be these religious fences that go up at times. Um, now, let's leave our nation's history and let's just go back um, to the 1500s. In the 1500s, there was this group that came on the scene called Anti-Baptists. And basically, Anabaptists, I should say that right, not anti, Anabaptists, okay? Um, anyway, uh, they, they believed in full immersion baptism, which is a radical practice at that time. Now, do we do full immersion baptism here at Grace Point? You can say yes. That's what we do. The Anabaptists did that. They came on the scene feeling like, there should be this full immersion baptism and declaration and uh, 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 confession of Christ that went along with all that. Well, the, the religious establishment of that day did not like that they were doing this. In fact, they got so upset, they began to persecute the Anabaptists. And you know what they would do to them? They would tie them up, weight them down with weights, and throw them into a river or a lake to perish, to drown, and say, there, be baptized with this. Aren't we human beings ones who build walls and barriers and who declare off in my way or no way, we just naturally tend to do that. And Jesus is a great barrier destroyer. And as liberating as it is to know that Christ breaks through barriers, that he reaches into every nook and cranny of culture and to every person's background and history, as great and liberating as that thought is, that's not his goal. His goal is to get to our hearts so that we can experience radical life transformation. That's why he breaks through barriers is to do something deep within our soul. So our big thought for the message today is this. Breaking down barriers is frequently necessary for radical change to take place in us. Breaking through barriers is frequently necessary for radical change. I love, I love this exchange between the Samaritan woman and Jesus. She's a yeah, butter. Everything he says, he says, yeah, but and some of us who have had little kids understand, yeah, but, amen? And teenagers, yeah, but. You may be talking to them and they'll go, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, right? And I used to say, let's get out of the yeah, but routine and let's talk here, you know? And she has this yeah, 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 but kind of interaction with the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes to her and asks for a drink and she goes, yeah, but. I'm a Samaritan woman and you are a Jew. Yeah, but he just blows right through that. Doesn't even hardly address that. And, and, and he talks about living water. If you knew I'm talking to you, she says, yeah, but there it is again. How are you going to do this? You don't have any drinking implement. Yeah, but she's setting up barriers. She's doing what, the, what we humans tend to naturally do. We set up barriers that need to be torn down. Um, are you greater than Jacob, our father? Are you greater than him? You'll never thirst again if you take the water I off to you. But as good as all those kind of yeah, but interactions were, Jesus drills right into her heart. Go, go call your husband. And she kind of gives him a tooth answer, but it's a yeah, but answer. You know, I, I, I don't have one. He says, you're right. You don't have one. You've had five of them, and now the one you're living with is no longer a, a husband. You're just living with him. And, and again, you, you know, th there's this deep revelation moment, right? You would think, and she, she acknowledges, yeah, you've got to be a prophet. And you think that would just kind of grab her heart. Here comes yeah, but again. Yeah, but you Jews worship in Jerusalem, and we Samaritans worship in the mountains. What's up with that? I'm going, what are you doing? He just told you something that's profound, that's prophetic. Five husbands, one you're living with is not your husband right now, right? And she goes, yeah, but what about worshiping? Where do we worship? Where's the right place? It seems so superficial and insignificant. Don't we just do that as human beings when Christ begins to drill down into us? Don't we tend to at times get superficial and concerned about things that really don't matter. Listen, I want you to hear this insight from the story of the Samaritan woman. The breaking down of your barriers is a way to bring you to vulnerability. 
That's what the Lord Jesus is trying to do when he breaks down barriers in our lives. Because then that opens your heart to honest evaluation, leading hopefully to receptivity to radical change. So when Christ breaks down these barriers in us, we tend to put them up as defense mechanisms, as, as places where we think that I can be safe in here and I can play in here and whatever. Um, he likes to break those down so that we have vulnerabilities, so that we'll do honest heart evaluation, so that we'll have receptivity to what he wants to do in our lives. So let's talk about getting vulnerable for just a moment here. What barriers hide you from honest evaluation and receptivity when it comes to the Lord God? What barriers hide you and I'm going to help you with this in just a moment, but I want you to put something down there this morning. What do you tend to erect as a barrier that you tend to hide behind? Years ago, our family had a great Pyrenees dog named Maggie. She was this huge, beautiful white dog, and a picture will pop up here pretty soon of who she, uh, what a Pyrenees looks like. Uh, that's just what she looked like, just like that. And she was 140 pounds, and she was a lover. They, they call them the gentle giant as a breed, and she was a gentle giant. She loved our kids. She was a great dog to have. When we moved from Brookings to, to Williston, or Williston, excuse me, I grew up in Williston, so sorry. I, but when we moved to Williston, okay, um, it, yeah, that wasn't just a slip. That was, yeah. Anyway, we packed up our belongings in the U-Haul, and I had the two boys with me in the truck and Maggie. Now, if you've been around the Great Pyrenees, their fur sheds all the time. And so we're going down, or going up to, to, to Williston, and it's 90 degrees. It's hot. This thing has no air conditioning. So I opened the windows, and guess what it was like in that cab? It was like a snowstorm. It was ridiculous. Hair was flying. I kept spitting it out of my mouth. And then every now and then she'd go, and slobber would go everywhere. And, you know, but, man, she loved us. And I loved that dog. I mean, I just, I loved that dog. And she had this one little habit. She, she was too big to be a house dog, and she had too much fur. She would get so hot. So we just didn't allow her in the house. But she wanted to be with her people so bad. So every now and then she would break into the house. Now she grew up with a miniature dachshund and a six-pound Maltese. She thought she was a little dog. She was not a little dog. So she'd run in the house, and of course that caused chaos because this big, huge dog's running all over the house. And she would hide. Huh? You know how she would hide? She would shove her head behind the piano. <laughs> or, well, that was actually her favorite one to do, or behind a chair. And she thought, I can't see you. You can't see me, right? And I would say, you dumb dog. You are, you're so, so gentle and such a good dog, but you're so short on brains. You just are not very bright. And we'd push her and pull her out of the house. And I, I, that to me is a visualization of what we often do with God. We, we erect a barrier, we hide behind something, and we think, I can't see you, God, you can't see me. And I just wonder, because I do this. I don't know if you do this. I do this. And I wonder at times, God, do I just look as silly to you as Maggie looked to me? I think so. Because we erect these barriers and we tend to hide behind them. And so what I want to do today with you is talk about how we erect some barriers that God maybe wants to break down in our lives. You see, he got to the Samaritan woman. He got to, her, to, the, to the big reveal in her life. It was that she was reliant upon these men, five husbands, and now a man that she wasn't married to. She had become reliant upon them, putting her hope and trust in them. They were, and they were kind of like a barrier to receptivity, to, to what God wanted to do. But in, you know, in her defense in that culture at that time, that's probably how she was surviving. That's probably how she was making it, by, by aligning with some men. Because in that culture, it wasn't very friendly to women. And so she was just surviving, most likely. And I think Jesus really drilled down into that. And, and so for her, Jesus revealed that the Samaritan woman had misplaced affections and trust in these men. It was a misplaced uh, a place of affection and trust. And we tend to do the same thing with barriers in our lives. And I want to talk to you about how we do this. Now, I want you to be thinking on that question. I said, what's a barrier that maybe you need to deal with in your life that's separating you from God and what he wants to do in you. So I want to give you some examples of barriers that we tend to build, that we tend to hide behind. And, and I, I think we might look a little silly to God, like Maggie looked 
to me when we hide behind these barriers. I think a lot of people feel, this is barrier one, that somehow they've been cheated in life. Somehow life hasn't been fair to them and there's some anger and there's some resentment and that kind of barrier, that resentment and anger barrier often is fueled by social media as they look at all these perfect pictures of everybody else's life. By the way, social media does one of two things. It presents an unrealistically great picture of somebody else because all they do is use this as a highlight reel or it's way too revealing and it ought not to even be on there. But once you deal with this kind of a barrier, sometimes these things like social media, they can fuel resentment and anger. And Jesus wants to break through that barrier and get to your heart so that you're vulnerable and receptive and can experience this transformative power. A second barrier I see frequently, especially in the Midwest culture, is I'm fine. I call it the I'm fine bar- uh, uh, barrier. Um, and following after Jesus wholeheartedly would mean, I have to admit, I'm not fine, that I need some help, that I can't do things on my own. But frequently, the I'm fine barrier is, is a problem with following after Christ. Third barrier. Sometimes we've been told, and I deal with this one, especially at critical moments of development in your life, We've been told that no one cares about us. Frequently growing up, we didn't go to anybody's house or do any kind of social interaction, and my dad would say, well, they don't care about us. And so I grew up kind of hearing, they don't care about us. And frequently my dad would say to us kids, be quiet, just stay out of the way. So that's kind of what you grew up with, and you think of, as you get up, get older, no one cares, and God doesn't care, and that's a barrier that, that has to be broken down. You have to get vulnerable so that you can be receptive to God and experience then that radical life change he wants to bring into your life. I see this one too a lot. This is number four barrier. Family is enough for me. I have a great family. I have all the support I need. I don't need anything else. It kind of goes along with that I'm fine barrier. A little bit different though in terms of, of, of the source of of, of, of reliance, but sometimes people that come through a real strong family, a really good family, don't see a need for anything else in their life, and up goes the barrier. I, I, a family's good enough for me. I don't need anything else. And, and you know, the, some of the hardest people to reach uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ are people who think they're fine, or they have great family situations, and they're thinking, what else do I need? And those things can be barriers to the movement of Christ in our lives. And then there's the theological barrier, this number five. Some, some struggle with uh, maybe the creation story of the Bible or the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ or, or you know, did the resurrection really happen? Um, are miracles really true? Or is it really truly a coming judgment of God? And there's this, I, I have unanswered doubts in my life that just are a barrier to God really moving in me. And then one last one I'm going to talk about. This is a a younger uh, group of folks in here than first hour. I'm looking around. So some some of you that are my age and a little older, God bless you for being out today. Um, But, you know, here's a barrier I see uh, frequently uh, as people get older um, is we don't longer do things like we uh, used to. The methods have changed drastically uh, over the years and it's, easy to get resentful and kind of embittered to saying, well, church just isn't the same as it used to be. And I don't like these new methods. I don't like these new songs. I don't like these new ways of doing things. I don't like this new preacher. You know, whatever, whatever we have going on, methods change. And, and, and sometimes it's just resentment in that regard. And it can become a real barrier to what God wants to do. Now, I want to say something to you if you're young. Things will change. You'll go through this too. And at some point, you'll have to decide what's most important in my life, what God's doing or the way I like it done. You hear what I'm saying? And at some point, you know, God will hopefully soften hearts and say, and you can still engage with them. And anyway, uh, these are barriers that I think we all face. And, And I'm sharing these examples to you because sometimes we read a story like the Samaritans, 
And we could say, yeah, look at how God broke through all the barriers of her life. And there's a disconnect that he wants to do that very same thing with us. And the reason that that examples in the Bible is for you and I to learn vicariously from it. God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing marrow from bone. And we're supposed to read a story like the Samaritans and we're supposed to go, oh, I have those barriers in my life too that God wants to break through. And I have to become vulnerable in admitting them and, and get transparent with the Lord and saying, okay, God, break through. I invite that into my life. And there's this receptivity. And then you can experience this radical life change that actually happens in the Samaritan woman's life, which we'll get to um, next week. And often, like the Samaritan woman, we have a layered sort of barrier thing going on. There's some superficial ones. We are all... How, how are you going to get a drink of water here, Jesus? You don't have an implement or something that's pretty superficial. How, how, how are you going to do the worship? We worship in Jerusalem or the mountains. You know, Jesus got right to the what I call the big reveal in her life, you've been reliant upon men. Five of them and now a sixth one. And oftentimes, he will do that very thing with you and me. He will get to the one thing that's really a barrier. And you know what? We don't want to react like the Samaritan woman reacted here. As soon as Jesus revealed to her the big reveal, you're reliant upon men, she immediately went to worship we worship. She threw up another barrier to kind of deflect Yeah, and we can't do that. And Jesus said to her, a time is coming when my worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. We're right back to John chapter 1. Jesus came full of what? Grace and truth. And he came to bring in the person of the Holy Spirit. That was John chapter 1. And we're right back there again. He said, the time is coming when my followers are going to be followers who worship me in spirit and in truth. And in order for us to step into this new paradigm of worshiping in spirit and truth. Jesus is saying, you've got to be willing to let barriers be torn down. You've got to be vulnerable and receptive to what I want to do and be willing to experience radical change in your life. So here's a reflection thought for us this morning. The true worshiper will worship in spirit and truth. And that requires that you and I are vulnerable, receptive to the Lord, willing to let Jesus break through barriers in our lives, let the Holy Spirit fill us and define us. See, the Samaritan woman had heard of the Messiah. She had heard of the Christ. And he said to her, of all people, plainly, I am Christ. Jesus doesn't do that very often in the Bible. He calls himself the Son of Man. He doesn't really say who he is. But to this woman, the Samaritan woman, this one who was considered an outcast because she was a Samaritan, this one who was considered a subclass because she was a woman, this one who had all kinds of relational issues going in her life because she had had five husbands and now was living with the six. To that person, Jesus says, I'm the Christ. Isn't that interesting? I find that really interesting. In Christ, there is no man or woman Barbarian or Scythian, Jew or Gentile. We'll talk about that some next week. But now I'm to the point I want to get to today, takeaways. I want to talk to you about what what do we take away from this story? Well, first of all, we see that the heart of Jesus is revealed as he breaks through barriers, creating worshipers then who worship in spirit and truth. So that's a takeaway to me. What Jesus wants to do is break through these barriers that separate us from God so that he can create this group of people who worship in spirit and truth. He breaks through our isolation. He breaks through our defense barriers. He breaks through the way we classify ourselves. He breaks through what separates us. Um, And he wants to do a radical life change on a very soul level in us. I uh, don't know about you, but I'm masterful personally at Erecting barriers at times. Insulating and isolating and protecting. And we all do it. And uh, Jesus frequently has to break through something I've erected so that my soul is being transformed. Let me give you some character qualities of spirit and truth worshipers. Such ones aren't playing games. 
Jesus didn't play a game with the Samaritan woman. She wanted to do the yeah, but game. He just kept drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling down into her. Just tearing them down one after another. Spirit and truth worshipers, we don't play games with God. Such wants are experiencing the dismantling frequently of barriers that separate them from God. It's just a frequent experience. Such wants are willing to be vulnerable, not self-defensive, especially against the transformative work of the Holy Spirit in them. There's a receptivity, there's an openness, there is a yearning, there is a desire, there is this just burning in your soul for God to move. Here's a point. Those who worship in spirit and truth will have the same heart towards others that Jesus demonstrated towards the Samaritan woman, and I'm changing gears on you a little bit. So you have all this deep transformative work going on in your soul. Guess what? Then you'll start yearning for that same thing to happen in those you love and that's what you associate with. Because the closer you get to the heart of God, the more you realize how much he loves you and he loves people. And you'll begin to yearn not only for this transformative experience in your own life, but for your friends and your coworkers and your family and the ones you love to experience the same kind of transformative work of the person of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus has given us all the ministry of reconciliation. We're all part of the priesthood of God. We all are called to minister Christ to others. And I'm... I, I love the, the, the label I've been hearing lately for what this is. This is becoming everyday missionaries. We're always on mission with Jesus Christ, no matter where we go, using our giftedness and our experience and our, our touching uh, by the Holy Spirit to break down barriers in others' lives as well as our own. We have to move from the mindset of being a spectator to the mindset of being a participant. Um, a few weeks ago, I was watching a... Uh, Kansas City Chiefs game, not the Super Bowl. By the way, I couldn't lose in the Super Bowl, you know, even though the Vikings weren't in it, because I, I expect them to lose. But anyway, I love the color red, and there were two teams with the color red, and I couldn't lose, because the red team was going to win. Anyway, side point, that has nothing to do with the message, but I just felt good about coming to that conclusion, that I can finally be a winner when it comes to the Super Bowl. So I'm watching the Kansas City Chiefs play. This is about, I don't know, four weeks ago. And they were playing the Titans. And they showed this one fan. Oh, man, it was hilarious. He was probably my height, maybe 150, pretty slight, built kind of guy. And he was a Chiefs fan, and the Chiefs were doing really well at the moment. And they showed this guy, and he was a stomping and a snorting, you know what I mean? You thought he'd be playing the game or something, but he's just a spectator here and they show him his face is all screwed up and he's just going yeah like you know like he did something no you just watched it you really did nothing absolutely at all other than buy a ticket and watch other people play the game we're called to play the game in Christ and first of all that means that we'll be receptive to him and vulnerable to him and allow him to break down barriers that separate us from him and experience that radical transformation. But then it's like God says, hey, man, I tell you what, I've graced you to grace others. Go out there and be used of me. In fact, yearn for it, ask for it, pray for it. I remember when I was doing, I, I've done this multiple times over my life, but really ask God to, to use me in ways that I don't know you know, how he will do it or what he wants to do. And I remember one time at New Hope having kind of this kind of a moment and really praying, God, I just want to go out in a community and I know you have divine moments and divine opportunities. I want to be open and receptive to it. And so immediately after we made that prayer that day, I remember going to uh, Walmart in, in, in Williston there and I was going to buy a supplement for something. And I'm um, standing there looking at them, trying to figure out the best one and which one's cheapest and on mission, you know, get this and get out of here. That's kind of what I do when I shop. So if I ever see you or don't see you when I'm shopping, it's not that I don't like you. I just am a male shopping, which males can hardly do one thing while at once, amen? So anyway, just so you know. So I was there looking at the supplements and I noticed this gal right next to me. 
she's just kind of crying, sobbing, looking at the supplements with me. And I thought, the first thought most males think in that situation, run! (laughs) What do you do when the female's crying by you? You run, amen? You leave that situation. And I remember I wanted to, you know, exit and had the flight thing happen. And it was like the Spirit said, this is what you've been praying for. And so I remember looking to her and saying, you okay? (laughs) Because, you know, males were kind of dumb. We don't know what to say. She's obviously not okay. She's crying at the supplements, you know. And she said to me, I'm so depressed. I'm so disoriented. I'm looking for something that can just help my mood. And I said, oh, okay. A supplement might help. I'm thinking... I'm a pastor. I probably should have something more profound than that to say. And, and she just kept kind of crying. She says, and, and, and I said, can I just pray for you? And she said, you know what? I feel so far from God right now, and I used to be so close to God. Yeah. So in that, that front of that supplement area, I laid my hands on her, and I asked her her name, and I prayed for her that God would just be her joy again and just fill her heart with his peace. And... Um, after I got done praying, she said, what state am I in? I said, oh, you are in bad shape, aren't you? This is North Dakota. Okay, we're only, you know, been traveling all over with my husband, and I'm just so disoriented. And at any rate, um, I said, I know a really good church. <laughs> and I suggested that she come to New Hope if they're hanging around. I, didn't tell her, I never told her I was a pastor. But I, I remember thinking, okay, God, this is what you want us to be like, just open and receptive to the moments you bring our way. But you have to do a work in our hearts usually first to make us receptive and vulnerable and having this real transformative thing going on in our own lives so that we can talk to other people and minister Christ to them in ways that maybe we don't even know will happen, but we're just open to it happening. So I want to encourage you, be usable by God. Be open to what God wants to do. You are an everyday uh, missionary for him. Amen. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads? Lord God, I want to thank you for the story of the Samaritan woman. I know it really speaks to my heart. And uh, I know that we human beings, God, to our own harm, are just masterful at erecting barriers. We try to protect our hearts and protect our lives and protect from being wounded and, and all that kind of thing by erecting sometimes these barriers around us. And we often do it unknowingly and unwittingly and not even on purpose. We just do it, Lord. It's kind of like a wound being scabbed over. Um, we, we often erect these things, Lord. And, and for you to minister to us and to really work in our lives frequently, you want to just break through those barriers. Jesus, I know it. We have to get vulnerable before you and we have to become receptive to you so that we can experience this radical change that you want to um, do in our lives. So I pray for everyone here today, Lord, that whatever barriers that are in our way today, that uh, God, in the name of Jesus, would you tear them down? Holy Spirit, would you fill our hearts to overflowing? Would you do a divine transformation in each one of us, Lord, so we no longer live but Christ lives in us? And Lord, I pray we get to this place that we're just walking so in tune with your Holy Spirit that we can then become an agent, an ambassador for you, Jesus, and that we can help others in their time of needs and and break down barriers, Lord, in their lives in cooperation with your Holy Spirit, Lord. God, would you do that kind of work in us? Thank you for this church, Lord. Uh, Thank you for their willingness to break through the barrier of of weather this morning. All kidding put aside. Lord, that that took some determination. I want to thank you for that. And I, I pray that you bless them and fill them with your Holy Spirit this day, Lord, and that we would live and move and have our being in you, Jesus. We love you and praise your holy name. And all God's people said,